So yeah, so I wanted to thank, uh, thank you for inviting me, um, Ryan. Uh, so this invitation is actually from not this year, but last year, um, and then COVID happened and all of the invited talks were canceled. So I was excited to go to Rome this year, but anyways, here we are. But I think it's actually been great anyways, and thanks to the organizers for all the fun, yeah, fun things that are going on that I'm trying to figure out. Uh, okay, anyways, yeah, so today I'm gonna to talk about communication complexity, but um, the work is basically motivated by, okay, I knew I'd have a problem. Oh, there we go. Uh, motivated by uh, lower bound questions. So uh, concrete lower bound questions. So given a computational model, uh, M, how hard is it to compute a particular function, a Boolean function? And you know, this is a age old problem in our field um, and, are not doing very well so far. So for general Boolean circuits, the best lower bound that we have so far is 5n. And that's been you know, lots of work. And for uh, formulas, we can uh, get into the third minus the low one lower bounds. Uh, that best was by Hosted. And if you go down to bounded depth circuits there, we're doing much better. Again, the best is by Hosted, getting a exponential in n to the one over d roughly. Um, <clears throat> So when we switch to uh, even more restricted models, the monotone circuits and monotone formulas, then uh, you know then then we're killing it. <laughs> so we have lower bounds for circuits that are basically two to the square root of n. Again, it's not optimal. It should be more like two to the n over log n. And but for formulas, we do have the optimal uh, two to the n lower bound. And so today I want to talk about um, uh, sort of a unified approach to many of the lower bounds that we currently have and well-known um, structured models, uh, monotone formula bounds, circuit monotone circuit bounds, monotone span program bounds, and also so lower bounds on um, size of extension complexity for linear programs and semi-definite programs. Um, and the theme of all of the wor this work is to try to show a unified approach to getting these lower bounds uh, through communication complexity that reveals like a very strong connection between these lower bound questions and uh, questions about refuting unsatisfiable CNF formulas. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with the uh, basics of communication complexity, since that's what this is all about. Uh, so two players, Alice and Bob, uh, trying to compute a joint function F. Uh, so Alice has an n-bit uh, bit string, Bob has an n-bit bit, bit string. Uh, Alice's is usually X, called X, and Bob's is Y. And <clears throat> they want to, uh, compute this function f of their of their joint inputs. And a protocol is just a, an agreed upon, um, it's, it's an agreed upon recipe basically where Alice looks at her input x and then sends some message to Bob based on her, on her input. And then Bob looking at the messages so far and his input, he sends a message back and so on and so forth. And then finally at the end of the protocol, the last message that's sent should be the value of the function f on, on their joint inputs. And the communication complexity of f is, or of a protocol for solving f is the minimum number of bits that have to be exchanged in the worst case over all the inputs x, x, y pairs of total length 2n. And the communication complexity of the function is just the minimum over all the protocols. So this should be familiar. Um, and what we're going to focus on is not just functions, but uh, search problems. So a search problem is uh, is more general than a function because on every input pair there can be there's always at least one valid solution, but there can be more than one valid solution. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the example that we'll keep coming back to is the uh, karshmer vigdorsson search problem associated with a Boolean function f. So f is an arbitrary Boolean function, and the karshmer vigdorsson search problem. Uh, Alice is given uh, an n-bit input that's supposed to be, that's, that's um, promised to be a one input. So f of x is promised to be one. Bob's given an arbitrary n-bit string with the promise that f of y is zero. And since the function f is well-defined, uh, since Alice has a one of the function and Bob has a zero, there's at least one coordinate i where xi and yi are different. And the search problem is to find such a coordinate. Okay, and there's a monotone version of it where now the function f is monotone and now they have to output a coordinate i, not just where they differ, but where xi is one and yi is zero. Okay, and since search problems are more general than functions, uh, it, it'll be 
it's, it's, it's harder to prove lower bounds in general for search problems. So that's what we're gonna be interested in mostly. Um, and I'm gonna focus on this method of proving lower bounds for communication complexity of search problems or functions uh, via this query to communication lifting. So the idea is really just to reduce the lower bound question about the communication complexity of a function to the decision tree complexity of a simpler function. And we'll do this reduction by, uh, <clears throat> by taking, starting with a function little f, and that's a n bit function. It could be a search problem or a function. And we're gonna compose f with an inner function called g, and g, I'll call that the gadget. And <clears throat> g has two inputs, an x input and a y input, and the composed function capital F here is obtained by replacing each of the variables that underlie little f with uh, g applied to x i y. So z i, an input to little f, gets replaced by g of x i y. And lifting theorem for a particular uh, communication uh, model and a, and a corresponding query model is a theorem that relates the communication complexity of the lifted function f to the query complexity of the top level or base function, little f, okay? And the idea here is that we'll pick a gadget G that's gonna be uh, sufficiently obfuscating so that the players, uh, you know, one player who has x1 and the other player who has y1, they have to exchange at least one bit in order to be able to compute G. So that's kind of the whole point of putting G in there is to make it so that really all the players can do is to um, follow the, the obvious uh, protocol for solving F simulated by a communication protocol. So I, I forgot to say this, but in the lifted problem, capital F, it, we're thinking of the lifted problem as a communication problem where Alice gets all the X parts, so the left part of the gadgets, and Bob gets the Y parts, and they're trying to, again, compute this lifted function. Okay. Um, uh, a simple example that's pretty that motivates this is where the base function is little f is the or of uh, n bits, so z1 or z2 or up to zn, and it's easy to see that the decision tree deterministic decision tree complexity of that is n. You have to query all the bits, um, and if we lift this with the inner gadget being the two bit and function, uh, we get this function here, and this and Alice gets the x part and Bob gets the y part. And this is just the set disjointness function. And we don't have a lifting theorem for the two bit and function, but if we did, we would get it, we would be able to show that this simple decision tree bound implies this much more complicated communication lower bound for disjointness. We do have this lower bound for disjointness, but, um, <clears throat> but I'm just, I'm, I'm illustrating the idea behind that if you have a gadget that's, you know, that, that makes you do some work, then the best thing that you, a lifting theorem would tell you the best thing you can do to solve the communication problem is to simulate the decision tree. So when at the top here, when Z1 is queried, the players would exchange bits to compute G on X1 and Y1 and et cetera. Okay, so there's a, a large number of lifting theorems now in the literature that people have been working on, uh, myself, um, students, colleagues, lots of people. Uh, it's been a really exciting area in the last, I don't know, 10 to 15, maybe 20 years. Uh, <clears throat> uh, actually it started, so some of the original results were, were by Raza McKenzie who in 99 proved uh, the sort of, I'd say, I'd say the most basic and interesting lifting theorem that connects uh, ordinary decision tree depth to deterministic communication complexity. Uh, so, <clears throat> so it's a lifting theorem between ordinary dis deterministic decision trees and corresponding deterministic communication complexity. Um, and another really early result is by Shurstoff uh, that connects uh, the real polynomial degree of the outer function little f to the rank of the communication matrix associated with the lifted function. Um, and the techniques used in these two papers are really quite, quite different. This, the Shurstoff one is linear algebraic. It's very elegant. It uses duality along with other results that came after this that are also kind of linear algebraic in nature. Whereas the um, lifting theorem of Roz McKenzie and other lifting theorems that sort of work with various notions of decision tree as the query model, they tend to be more combinatorial, combinatorial or Fourier analytic. Um, <clears throat> so why do we care about all these lifting theorems? There's a huge number of 
they've they've been used to solve lots of open problems. So today I'll talk mostly about how they've been applied to prove lower bounds in concrete models, but they've also been used to get lower bounds in proof complexity, lower bounds for linear secret sharing schemes, uh, and so on down the list. Uh, to me, the, the 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 most fun one, or the maybe the most surprising one, is a result by Mika Goose, who showed as part of his PhD work, he solved or he disproved the alone sack Seymour. Uh, conjecture and graph theory using uh, non-deterministic lifting. And I thought this was quite interesting because this conjecture really has nothing, the face of it has really nothing to do with computation or with communication. It's just a graph theory question. Um, so in the reason lifting, it, it tends to be a good approach to these questions. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, the technique allows you to sort of find hard instances in, in a, in a uh, in sort of a, a, a systematic way. And sometimes that's like half the battle is finding the right hard instance. And the second nice thing about it is since it's an equivalence, you have an upper and a lower bound. So it can be particularly useful for separations. Okay, <clears throat> so today I wanna to start by telling you about this lower, lower bound sort of programmer template where we want to prove lower bounds on a particular class of algorithms like monotone formulas or extension complexity of linear programs, for example. And we wanna do this through a sequence of reductions that goes through communication complexity via lifting theorem, and eventually uh, reduces the question to a uh, question about how hard it is to refute an uns a particular unset formula in a particular proof system. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and we can apply this template. Uh, there's some, you know, it's not, it requires some changes for some of these, but we can apply this template again, like I said in the beginning, to get uh, strong lower bounds for monotone formulas, monotone circuits, span, monotone span programs, and, and extension complexity results. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how to apply this to get to, to reprove the known lower bounds for monotone formulas and monotone circuits, and then I'll talk a little bit about how it works for the extension complexity results. Okay, so we said before, we want to start with uh, a class of algorithms. In this case, our class of algorithms are monotone formulas. And we want to prove a you know, exponential lower bound on the size of monotone formulas for computing some Boolean function F. And we wanna reduce this to some communication problem. So the very first thing we have to do is uh, you know, find a way to morph the size question about monotone formulas to an equivalent question about the communication complexity of something. And luckily this was already done by uh, the karshmir vigdorsson theorem, which, <clears throat> which states that the um, communication complexity of the monotone karshmir vigdorsson search problem associated with the Boolean function F. And that's, uh, you know, remember that's where Alice gets a one input of F and Bob gets a zero input. And they're trying to find a coordinate where X is one and y is where xi is one and yi is zero. So they proved that the communication complexity of that is the same as the log of the monotone formula size of f. And this is, a, this is an equivalence, but the direction that's, that we need is actually the, interest, the easier direction. And it's, it's you just, uh, the players um, <clears throat> given a formula of some, so the formula can be balanced. So given, given a formula of depth, like log the size, the players start at the top where the circuit on X is one and the circuit evaluated on Y is zero. And they just trace a path down to a leaf by inductively maintaining that the subcircuit always has that property that X evaluated on that subcircuit is one and, and Y is zero. And they can do that by at every, at every, every step, it's either an or or an AND gate, they can send one bit. If it's an OR gate, then the Y player sends the bit to say which way to go. And if it's an AND gate, the X player sends a bit and they just follow a path. So the number of uh, bits that are sent is the length or the height of the balanced formula, which is like log the size of the formula. Okay, so we start with that, that's great. And now I want to show you how to, uh, how to complete these steps. And actually to complete these steps, we're really actually gonna start, we're gonna start with the blue and go up. Uh, so we're actually gonna, and the reason for this, as I said before, we wanna concoct this formula capital F to be a hard instance uh, instead of starting with one that we think might be a hard instance. So we're gonna start with uh, an unset formula that we know is hard and then we'll work our way up. Okay, 
<clears throat> so let me try to explain how this works. So this is, um, I'm gonna just describe how to start with an unset formula, C, that's a, a CNF formula, and how to basically convert it to a monotone function F. And if we're doing this for monotone formulas, uh, then again, the purple, the, the class of algorithms up, up here, the purple is gonna to correspond to you know, monotone formulas. Communication complexity is gonna be ordinary communication complexity. And the query complexity is gonna be decision tree complexity. And the corresponding proof system, which corresponds to decision tree complexity is going to be tree-like resolution, okay? So we start with an unset formula C over n variables, C1 through Zn. Uh, and we're going to be interested in the search problem associated with C, which is just given an assignment to the variables, Z1 through Zn, the, you want to output some clause that's false. Okay, And since I promised that C is unsatisfiable, there's always at least one answer. There's always at least one violated clause, but there might be many. And we were interested in the decision tree complexity of the search problem. That's the query model that we care about. And that is the same, so the height of the minimal decision tree for this search problem is exactly the same as the height of the minimal tree resolution refutation of C. Okay, so that's how we're relating the proof complexity in, for, the, for the case of monotone formulas, the proof complexity of refuting C to uh, the query complexity of the search problem, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and now we want to, uh, convert that to some sort of communication problem. And we'll do that by lifting. <clears throat> so we're gonna just take this CNF formula and we have our gadget G and we're going to compose this formula with the gadget G by just replacing each variable ZI by G applied to XI and YI. Okay, so this CSP will have variables X1 X through XN and Y1 through YN. And here's an example down here where C, this is satisfiable, but anyways, C has two clauses and uh, C composed with the two bit and gadget, you would just replace each ZI by the conjunction of XI and YI. And so you get this CSP, okay? And again, now in the lifted search problem, uh, now Alice is gonna get all the X's, X1 through XN and Bob's gonna be given the Y's. And it's the same search problem, but now on the lifted instance. So they want to together agree on some constraint that's falsified by their joint assignment, okay? In the lifting theorem, ross mckenzie lifting theorem automatically tells us that if we have good lower bounds on the decision tree complexity of this search problem, which are easy to come by, then we automatically get uh, the corresponding communication lower bounds on the lifted search problem, okay? So that's all sounds good. Um, but the one issue is that this search problem isn't of the right type. So we need uh, Karshmer, we need to uh, have, in order to get lower bounds for monotone formula size, we need to prove lower bounds on the monotone, you know, on the monotone Karshmer Vigdorsen, on some monotone Karshmer Vigdorsen search problem for an associated function. Um, so luckily, it turns out that this search problem here, the composed search problem is actually um, <clears throat> viewed, viewed the right way. It is actually uh, <clears throat> the same as the uh, uh, karshmer Riederson search problem for an associated monotone function, capital F, okay? So I'm not gonna prove that today. It's not hard to prove and it has several proofs, but the theorem is that for any unsatisfiable formula, C and a formula C, and for uh, the gadget that we're gonna be using, which is the index gadget G, there's an associated monotone Boolean function, capital F, and um, <clears throat> it's gonna be over a polynomial in, in, in many variables, uh, and it's gonna be in NP, uh, so it's explicit, such that uh, this, this search problem, the lifted search problem associated with uh, C composed with G, that's gonna basically be the same as the monotone Kirshner Vigdorsen search problem. Okay, so, so by this theorem that now we have uh, now we're kind of done. So once we have this deterministic lifting theorem, you know, we take some formula C that's hard for tree resolution. That means it has high decision tree complexity, the search problem. By lifting, the <coughs> lifted search problem has high communication complexity. And that's the same thing by the theorem in the last slide. That's the same thing as saying that the Karshman or Vigdorsen search problem associated with F uh, is hard. And that's 
by Karshman and Friedrichsen equivalents, that means that this formula size is big. And this was used in exactly this way by, by Ros and McKenzie, although they didn't set it up quite like this, but this it really was exactly this, in hindsight, it was really, really was exactly this way that they applied this to not just prove monotone formula bounds, but to separate levels of the monotone hierarchy um, and so on. Um, now, how are we gonna get this to work for circuits, for monotone circuits? So again, we have to start with some, some relationship that connects the monotone circuit size of a Boolean function F to some to the communication complexity of, of something in some communication model. And I think this result is somehow less well known, although it's just as beautiful and elegant, uh, that there is a correspondence here. And it was due to Rasbra from a number of years ago. And he uh, studies a DAG-like model of communication and <clears throat> proves that uh, in this DAG-like model, the DAG-like communication complexity of the Karshmer Vigerson search problem is exactly the same as the monotone circuit size of F. And this is for any F. And there's a non-monotone version of this as well. So this is saying to prove circuit lower bounds, it's the same as trying to prove lower bounds on the size of, uh, you know, on, on the size of these DAG-like communication protocols for the, mon uh, for the Karshmer Rigerson problem, okay? Okay. Uh, so once we have that, and I have to tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about what this DAG-like communication model is, but once we have that, uh, and then there's a corresponding DAG-like lifting theorem that was, that was proven by um, uh, uh, Gard, Goose, Kamath, and Sokolov. Um, so once you have the DAG-like lifting theorem, uh, so then we go from monotone circuits to DAG-like communication complexity of the composed search problem, which that theorem showed us that's the same problem as the monotone Kirschman Rigerson problem associated with F. And then the DAG like lifting reduces that to DAG like decision tree complexity of the search problem. And that turns out to be the same as the resolution complexity of, of refuting C. Okay, so again, all of this is basically once you have this powerful lifting theorem, <clears throat> then you have an automatic way of getting lower bounds on monotone circuit size for certain functions from resolution lower bounds. Okay. And I just wanna say a few words about, um, yeah, about this equivalence. I won't have too much time to talk, say it in detail. But um, one thing to note is that you can't just uh, take the DAG-like models of query or communication to just be you know, like branching programs or to just be DAGs because it, these search problems are always in NP. So it's easy to solve these problems with a regular DAG. So instead we want to, the DAG has to be defined so that um, it, in some sense, it actually witnesses or gives a proof of the um, uh, of the totality of the underlying uh, Boolean function f. Uh, <clears throat> so the definition of it is a little bit complicated, but uh, so this is the definition of the so-called DAG-like communication protocols. So before the picture on the right here of a communication protocol was a tree where uh, each vertex of the tree, Alice or Bob would speak, and there was an associated uh, combinatorial rectangle associated with each vertex, which is the set of all possible pairs of inputs that is actually always a rectangle um, <clears throat> that makes it to that node. In the case of DAG-like protocols, this is now DAG. Um, uh, but, and again, we have uh, for every, so it's an underlying DAG, and there's a, a vertex V0, that's the, that's the root, the start vertex. And again, associated with all of the nodes of the protocol is a, is a rectangle. So if this was V, there's an associated rectangle R sub V. And at the leaves, we have the answers. So associated with every leaf vertex of the DAG is an answer. So an answer meaning if this, if, if this DAG is supposed to be solving the Karsman Vigerson <clears throat> uh, search problem for F, then the answer here should be you know, one of the N coordinates because they're trying to find the coordinate where they differ. And the special properties that are required beyond that is consistency. So if you have a vertex V with children V prime and V double prime, then the rectangle for V has to be contained in the union of the two rectangles below you. And, and then the correctness, every leaf vertex, the value of the leaf has to be good for all of the XY pairs in the rectangle associated with that vertex. Mm -hmm. And again, Razbrov proved, and the proof was simplified by Sokolov, 
that he proved that the DAG-like communication complexity of the karshmer vigerson search problem is exactly the same as the circuit size, and there's a monotone version of it as well. So it's re really, I think, a beautiful theorem. Um, and it's called PL, the PLS. Uh, so it's, it has this name PLS to the CC because it's the communication complexity analog of the TFNP class PLS. It might not be uh, so easy to see that, but. <clears throat> okay. So I just described in, in sort of high level how you apply this to get lower bounds for monotone formulas and for monotone circuits. Um, I just wanna say a word about how to do this for extension complexity. Uh, so again, the first step is to relate the, the model that you wanna get lower bounds for, in this case, LP extension complexity, you have to relate that to some kind of communication model. And that was done um, in a really wonderful paper by Yanakakis, where he proved that the extension complexity of linear program is the same as the non-negative rank of the slack matrix associated with, with the LP. And that in turn has a, a, has a equivalent formulation as a communication protocol, uh, the, you know, the, the length of a randomized communication protocol where they have to compute the slack value in expectation over the random bits. So that's the communication model. And in the lifting theorem that was proven in CLRS, they, the lifting theorem went from this non-negative rank uh, to the degree, Shirley Adams degree of refuting a CNF. And for SDP extension complexity, again, the, the, the here you have SDP rank and the proof system is SOS. And so you go from uh, proving lower bounds on SDP extension complexity, which is the same as SDP rank via uh, degree lower bounds on the sum of squares proof system for refuting an unset CNF. Okay. Um, so, and this picture arises, and this is, uh, I forgot to put the reference here, but this is the paper monotone, what's it called? Adventures in monotone computation and totals uh, and, and search problems, something like that. Um, and so it gives actually a really nice picture of, of sort of the world. So the TFNP, the, the bright green, these are cl complexity classes that everybody's probably familiar with, total functions in NP. Uh, and each of them sort of corresponds to, uh, to a class of total functions whose uh, proof of totality relies on some general principle. So PPA, it relies on like the mod two principle uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can formalize, you know, Christos Papadonitra formalized, uh, this is a complexity class by associating. Um, so again, e each of these classes, there's, there's sort of an underlying graph uh, of exponential size where you, the edges in the graph are sort of described by polynomial time computations. So the original uh, classes here were based on sort of Turing machine uh, definition, but you can, uh, just like we often do, so P originally was defined for, you know, Turing machines, but then we uh, also can define a communication version of it and the decision tree or query version of it. You can do the same thing here. And what we see is that, you know, when these classes are natural, their communication and, and query versions are also supernatural. So PPA uh, corresponds to span program, monotone span programs over mod two. That's the communication version. And for the query version, we get null Stonsatz refutations over F2. And, and likewise, we get these other, I mean, it's not completely filled in, but we're starting to see a really nice picture emerging of what's going on here. Okay. Um, oh, one question. Should I end? Uh, what time should I end? Uh, it's up to you, Tony. The official, <laughs> the official thing uh, ends in half an hour, I think. Okay. But I, I'll leave a little time for questions, I guess. Sounds good, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, so for the rest of the talk, I want to just say a few words about a new a, a new proof of, of lifting theorem that works in the deterministic in the dag like case that goes uh, sort of a direct reduction to a sun, to the sunflower robust sunflower lemma, and so and I want to talk a little bit about all the interconnections that the sunflower lemma has to these lower bound questions, and then I want to spend a little bit of time on directions and open problems and new directions. It was hard for me to, um, to, to narrow this down to just a few. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I wanna show you a little bit about, how, well, I'm not really gonna be able to do the proof, but I wanna at least explain a little bit about how one way to prove lifting for the deterministic 
case and for the Daglight case. The, the original proofs of this, so the Ross McKenzie proof and some follow-up proofs um, were proven uh, using either combinatorial methods or Fourier analytic methods um, for both the deterministic and the Daglight case. And, and this is also a combinatorial method, but it's a direct reduction to the sunflower lemma. Uh, okay, so the statement of the theorem, this is the statement of the Ross McKenzie theorem. F again is an n bit Boolean function or search problem, it's arbitrary. And G is fixed to be the index gadget. Uh, so the index gadget takes X, X is a, uh, <clears throat> the, the X, you think of X as like a pointer into this a Y, which is a binary vector. And Y for us will have length polynomial in N and X of course will have length log of the length of y. And um, you know the, the output of this is just the whatever value, whatever bit value x points to in y. So y sub x. And the deterministic lifting theorem states that the decision tree complexity of the outer function is roughly the same as the communication complexity of the lifted. And the reason for the log n here, which is which is a plus, it's a bonus, is that you're going to get an, a log n overhead when you simulate a decision tree by a communication protocol because of because every time they try to query an underlying variable of the outer function, so a zi, the players will have to compute g on xi, yi, and in this case, the way that they can do that is the the Alice player who has a smaller uh, smaller vector, she'll just send her whole string to Bob, and so that has cost order log n. So that's the reason for this. And in the lower bound, in the other direction, going from a communication protocol to a decision tree, here we also recover the log n. So we show that uh, if you have a communication protocol, uh, it can be, you can extract from a decision tree that has cost, or that has height, uh, the communication complexity divided by order log n. Okay, and like I said, this, this new proof uses the sunflower lemma as a back black box, and it, holds uh, fairly straightforwardly for the dag light case. Um, and it also has a slightly improved gadget size. So we're all obsessed with making the gadget size or the, the length of X and therefore also the length of Y a constant or even log log M on the length of X would be great. And um, that would resolve all sorts of open problems or make all these lower bounds tight. Uh, so we don't do that, but we are able to get, a, a, get the gadget size to to near linear, so the size of y to be near linear instead of before it was something like n to the fourth or something like that. Okay, so just a quick review what the sunflower lemma is. So you have an underlying n uniform set system. So capital X is a bunch of sets, each of size n from some universe. And the Erdos's sunflower lemma <clears throat> states that uh, as long as X is big enough, then it contains a sunflower with p petals. So as long as it's at least yeah, as long as it's least r to the n, I'll explain what r is in a minute, is in a minute, then it contains a sunflower with p petals. And what's a sunflower? Well, it's just a collection, a subset of the sets in X with the property that their common intersection, which is called the core, is the same. So the intersection of every pair is always the same. And then outside of the core, the sets are disjoint. So this is an example of a sunflower with p equals 11 petals and n equals four, and the core has size two, okay? And uh, it was conjectured to be true when R was equal to roughly equal to P. And what Erdos proved originally was it's, it is true for P roughly, for R roughly P times N. And in a breakthrough result from two years ago, a big step was made toward the conjecture by proving the sunflower lemma when R was roughly P times log of PN. Okay. So we're gonna actually work with a, 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 another version of the sunflower lemma called the robust sunflower lemma that was, the robust sunflower lemma was originally introduced by Ben Rossman. And um, it's known that the robust one and the regular one are equivalent up to, up to the changes in parameters that are usually not that important. But um, <clears throat> so the robust one might not look like the original one, but I wanna state it in a form that it'll be clear how it's gonna be applied directly to prove lifting. So in the robust version, X is again an N uniform set system. This isn't necessary, but for the application, I'm gonna, uh, X is actually gonna be block respecting. So we'll our underlying universe U will have say M times N elements in it, and they're gonna be partitioned into blocks. 
uh, n blocks, each block of size m. And by n uniform block respecting, I mean that the each set in a capital X will have exactly one element chosen from each of the blocks. So and this, this is an example of a set that could be an X, the pink. Okay, now the, the robust sunflower lemma says that if X is uh, dense and dense is the same thing as spread in the sunflower literature, uh, density is, we're looking at all, um, it's, 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 a, it's a measure of sort of um, that, that, that we don't know a whole lot about any block that we, that we can't really predict with, with very much certainty, you know, for any subset of blocks or for any block, what, you know, what, what, what value is chosen. Um, so it's dense if for every subset I of blocks, the min entropy of the marginal distribution X restricted to the blocks I is big, okay? Um, and from a set system X, we can always make this DNF that corresponds to the set system by just having one term for every um, set in the set system. So Y3, Y13, Y16, if I did it right, should correspond to this pink uh, set. And so we just take a disjunction over all terms where each term represents one of the sets. And the robust sunflower lemma, which was proven in ALWS, uh, states that as long as X is R dense for appropriate choice of R, then if we take a random assignment to the underlying variables of the CNF, the probability that it's not set to one is very, very small. Um, so this is saying that as long as X is nice and spread out, when we, uh, when we take a random assignment to the variables with all the exponentially small probability, the DNF is gonna be set to one, okay? And the parameters we're gonna use are M is gonna be polynomial in N, R is gonna be that, and epsilon, like I said, is gonna be very small, exponentially small in N. So this, in this form, it looks a little bit like a switching lemma because it's talking about a DNF formula and how hard it is to, you know, to kill it off, to set it to one in this case. Um, and I'm not gonna have time to really explain this, but basically the simulation uh, to prove the lifting theorem, you, it's a simulation theorem. So it's, it's a constructive argument where you take a protocol pi for the lifted thing and you extract from a decision tree T. And the way it's done to a large extent is, is to just uh, track the protocol pi. And uh, at, at some points in time, when you learn too much information about some of the coordinates, you're gonna query some of the variables. So in the simulation, we'll, May always maintain the invariant that uh, you know at any point in time we have this rectangle in the protocol, and we're always going to maintain the invariant as we walk down the protocol that the x part of the rectangle, the the Alice's inputs is dense, and uh, y is large. <clears throat> and whenever Bob sends a bit, we're always going to go to the bigger side, meaning when y sends a bit, it partitions the current set of y's in the rectangle into two pieces and we'll always go to the bigger side. Same thing for Alice. And then from time to time, we're gonna lose the invariant properties. We'll, the largeness will we'll never get lose it, but the x one will become, at some, at some point in time after more and more bits are sent, we'll learn more about x and it will no longer be dense. So there'll be some subset of blocks where we learn too much about them. So at that point, we want to fix that subset of blocks to a particular too likely value. And then we wanna query the corresponding variables in the decision tree that corresponds to those blocks. And that's gonna refine the current rectangle. And the hard part is to prove that this, this refined rectangles over all the choices for uh, beta, which is the ways that we're querying the Z's, that this refinement is always gonna to continue to satisfy this invariant, okay? And what we were able to show, like just directly using the robust sunflower lemma, is essentially that this, these conditions, that these refinements continue to be large and dense, follows uh, the hard part of it, follows directly from this robust sunflower lemma. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so just a few words on sunflower lemma. So I find it really interesting that it's used in so many different ways to, uh, you know, in, in so many interconnected ways. So it was originally used by Rasbroff as a key tool to proving monotone circuit bounds for the clique function. 
And now we have another way to prove monotone circuit bounds via lifting that now where the lifting theorem is proven directly using the sunflower lemma. Um, so that's one connection right there. The two proofs that you get here uh, for monotone circuit bounds are actually different. And it seems like they should be the same, but they're actually not quite the same. We can also prove proof complexity bounds directly using the sunflower lemma. And um, I also wanted to mention AC zero bounds. So the switching lemma is sort of similar in a lot of ways to the robust sunflower lemma statement. And the switching lemma was used to prove strong bounds for AC zero, which is you know non-monotone model of computation. And actually depth three lower bounds for AC zero were, were proven uh, using the sunflower lemma. So, and then there's all these other really cool applications of the sunflower lemma for pseudo randomness for, and for other types of lower bounds, data structure bounds, and then for purely combinatorial reasons, which is of course where the sunflower lemma came from in the first place. So the sunflower lemma is in the center here, it's the core, but really there's, I would think that there should be all sorts of more interconnections between all of these petals here. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so I'm gonna spend the next little bit, 10, 10 minutes, 15, 10 or so minutes, talking about, um, yeah, sort of beyond, uh, the monotone bounds that, and the extension complexity bounds that I showed before. Um, so the question here is, can we use these techniques or can we generalize and how, how should we be generalizing these techniques so that we can get beyond monotone computation? Um, so first of all, just to point out that uh, we don't really have to get beyond monotone computation. So it's known, been known for a long time that if you prove monotone lower bounds for, for the right functions, in particular slice functions, then they automatically uh, also give you non-monotone lower bounds. Um, so one way to you know you know one way to to get non-monotone bounds is to just try to understand or try to develop techniques that get us closer and closer to slice functions. And there's already been uh, precedents and work on this along these lines by by Ben Rossman. Um, and for formulas, I want to talk about two specific like well-known. Um, uh, I don't know, well, well known approaches to proving formula size bounds and how lifting could be your communication complexity is, is seems really uh, related. <clears throat> okay, so first AC zero. So um, again, it's similar to monotone computation. It's known that if we could get good enough lower bounds for, for AC zero, uh, good enough meaning truly exponential lower bounds for certain functions or even uh, yeah, anyways, really strong bounds that that would imply formula size bounds. So again, we don't have to, uh, so we, we could just stick with trying to improve our techniques for AC zero lower bounds, even though right now that seems very hard. The current methods for proving AC zero bounds is switching lemma and that, that lower bound, uh, the technique so far, it only, it's exponential as a function of D. So the bound is like exponential and N to the one over D and would really like this to be independent of D. Um, so again, there's a equivalence. So the karshmir vigerson equivalence continues to hold for bounded depth circuits. So for bounded depth circuits, the, the characterization is you uh, uh, communication complexity of D round protocols where the players can only, you know, you know, Alice speaks Bob, the number of rounds is D, but at every round they can send however many bits they want. Uh, and you're counting total number of bits, but you're restricting to D rounds. So the communication complexity of D round protocols for the karshman vigerson search problem is equivalent to the, to the log of the AC0 size. Um, so this is why I'm interested in trying to understand, or and I'm not the first person, people have been wanting for a long time to get better techniques for AC0, in particular top-down techniques. And um, the original depth three results that used the sunflower lemma uh, proved strong bounds for depth three circuits. And, and it seems that the robust sunflower lemma or generalizations of it even uh, should be useful, I would think, to prove, uh, to get an alternative lower bound for, for bounded depth circuits. Um, so second is uh, another approach, of course, is, is the, the, one of the original approaches and the whole, the whole motivation for really studying composed functions came from this, the Karshman, KRW conjecture. And this is a conjecture that's aimed toward, uh, you know, an approach toward proving uh, formula bounds. So the, the setup is just the way we had it. So except that G is elevated to have the same status as F. So here F is an arbitrary uh, Boolean function. 
n bits. M is an G, sorry, G is another arbitrary Boolean function on m bits, and we compose them to get this composed problem. Okay. <clears throat> and the Karshmir Vigerson KRW conjecture is that uh, no matter what f and g are, that the depth, the you know, the, the best depth of a formula for computing the composed function should be just the obvious thing where you, you know, you first solve G and that takes you whatever the minimal formula depth is for G plus, and then once you have all of those, then you solve F. So that takes you depth of F plus depth of G. And if this conjecture can be proven in general for every F and G, uh, this implies that P doesn't equal NC1. And by the karshmir vigerson equivalence, this is the same then to prove this conjecture. It's equivalent to proving that the Karshmer, that the communication complexity of the karshmir vigerson search problem for the composed function is basically equal to the communication complexity of the karshmir vigerson game for F plus that for G. Um, so there's been a long, long line of, of really exciting work resolving special cases and most of these papers have really, you know, new techniques, really nice new ideas in them. But we're still pretty far away from, from resolving it in general. But, you know, it's, it's really an exciting sequence of works. And a lot of the ideas from these papers actually share idea, you know, were used in lifting and, and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to tell you about one new, relatively new result that um, studies. So one thing that wasn't known is whether the monotone version of this conjecture was true. So if we restrict to monotone functions f and g, can we then prove that the <clears throat> communication complexity of the monotone karshman vigerson uh, search problem for the composed one is equal to the complexity of the sum of the two, the monotone ones? So that's still not known. But what we were able to do is to prove, almost prove it. So we were able to prove it for any outer function f that's monotone and for any g, as long as g is a lifted function. So we were able to show the KRW conjecture holes. And this should be, there should be M's on the right here. Um, and again, we proved this by basically using lifting. Um, and now we also defined something in between uh, monotone and, and the really, you know, the real case that we called semi-monotone. That's too hard to describe here, but, but anyways, we proved a, a semi-monotone version of, of KRW with lots of caveats, but it's a step, I think, toward uh, the non-monotone case. Um, so the second area that I wanted to talk about quickly is just uh, algebraic circuit bounds. So, you know, it should be easier to prove algebraic circuit bounds than it is to prove Boolean circuit bounds. So it's a necessary step to getting Boolean circuit bounds. And it's interesting because there's not, uh, the, method, the methods are, are not very similar. So the lower bounds and, and circuits, a lot of them use communication and lifting, and there's almost none that use, none that use lifting that I know of and, and none that directly use communication complexity until recently. Uh, <clears throat> and so again, for circuits, we, it's, there's a lot of lower bounds known for the case of monotone algebraic circuits where the coefficients have to be positive. And that's just because things can't cancel. So it's a whole lot easier to keep track of measures of progress. Um, but in a recent paper, Pavel Hrubas uh, made this really cool discovery, which is sort of the analog of slice functions, but I think it's much cooler uh, in the algebraic world. So what he showed was, again, at a high level, that it's you can stick with monotone algebraic circuits as long as you uh, prove lower bounds on monotone algebraic circuits for, for the right functions. And he studied these like functions that are not smooth. So you look at polynomials of the form. So f of n is some polynomial that's easy. It's monotone and it's easy. And h of n is another polynomial that's monotone and, and hard. And epsilon, and we're literally adding these two polynomials together. So th think of this as if epsilon is really small, like less than two to the two to the minus n, think of this epsilon h of n. It's just a small perturbation of, of this polynomial f of n. And so what, what Pavel showed is that if you can prove lower bounds for small enough epsilon, monotone lower bounds on this perturbed version of F, that that implies non-monotone algebraic circuit bounds. And it's really cool, I think. Um, you know, again, it relates to, so it's really showing that you have a function that's easy, but uh, very close to it, you know, 
a very small perturbation of it is becomes very hard. Um, and uh, this this uh, this theorem, which is actually in this conference, uh, makes progress on on this. So first of all, they, uh, they they are able to prove lower bounds on in this for the setup not for the epsilon that we need in order to get non-monotone balance, but still for epsilon exponentially small, two to the minus delta n. And uh, the interesting thing of oh, the statement is great, and they have another, this isn't the only statement that they prove. But to me, what's really interesting about this is that they, first, they have this really clever way of constructing hard polynomials from communication complexity hard functions. Uh, so they, they take these lifted functions from communication complexity and they have this really cute way of of uh, turning them into hard polynomials. And then to get the lower bound, it's, it doesn't directly reduce to a communication bound, but the proof is a direct reduction to discrepancy and corruption bounds, which is you know, a ma main approach toward proving communication bounds. Uh, log rank conjecture, another big, big uh, open problem by, asked by Lovas and Sachs, it asks whether the, it's always the case that the communication complexity of a Boolean function f can al is always polynomial in the log of the rank of the matrix associated with f. And so in other words, if this is true, that would just mean that it would, would be remarkable to some extent. It would mean that, you know, the communication complexity, at least understanding roughly what it is, is, is easy. It's just basically, you just have to understand the rank of the matrix. Um, <clears throat> And the conjecture is that this is true, um, but we're very far away from it. The uh, breakthrough result by Lovett got the square root of the rank before then there was really not, not much known. And the lower bound again is extremely far away from the right answer. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, recently there's been a, a lot of work on trying to prove this conjecture for special cases and in particular for lifted functions. So if we look at fun communication functions F that are lifted, uh, then can we prove this? And in this new paper, again, appearing at this conference, they proved that uh, if you lift um, <clears throat> uh, an arbitrary Boolean function with the two bit and function, they proved the lifting theorem that shows that the and decision tree complexity of F is polynomial in the log rank of the matrix associated with the lifted function. It's not quite that because they get this log n factor here which is a bummer, but anyways, it's close. And using that, um, they're able to, to prove, almost prove the log rate conjecture uh, for this case of, of lifted functions, lifted by the two bit and. Um, so I just wanted to mention one more thing. Uh, so another thing you can do with lifting is you can prove uh, size depth trade-offs. Uh, so for proof systems, let's think about resolution or cutting planes. If you don't know what they are, it doesn't matter. It's just some proof system for refuting um, CNFs and, you and the proof is like some kind of DAG. So it starts, you know, it starts at the top and you're, or it starts at the axioms or, or the clauses and it derives new things from previous ones until finally we're trying to derive, you know, the identically false line. And <clears throat> what we showed here is that there is a family of unsatisfiable formulas, F sub n over n variables. These are CNF formulas. And they have, uh, well, any CNF formula over n variables trivially has a size two to the n refutation of depth n. So you just make like a decision tree, just try all the values of all the variables. They'll have depth n and size two to the n. But we show that for this particular family of instances that if you, um, if you restrict the size to not be exponential, but instead to be sub-exponential, then the depth necessarily becomes enormous. So, so we call it supercritical. Uh, I think it was phrased maybe by Nordstrom. Anyways, somebody came up with the term supercritical, which means that the depth goes well beyond what the minimal depth is if you don't impose any size constraints. So, so this is saying that these formulas, although they have small depth proofs, if you restrict the size to be sub-exponential, the depth will become exponential. And what's interesting, I think, about this theorem is it uses this very nice idea by Rasbaroff that we're using composition just like we've been doing all along in lifting, but we're doing it in a very different way here where we're gonna, before any time we composed, we always did it on disjoint sets of variables. So you always went from an original formula. When, when you composed it, you always ended up with many more variables. Here, we're gonna uh, compose it in a different way. So we, if we have a formula F over variable Z1 through Zn, 
the way we'll compose it with inner gadget is uh, we're going to have a smaller number of variables, little m, on the right. And zi will be replaced by this function, gi, which in our case is the XOR, of the variables on the right that are connected to, to, the, to the zi uh, node on the left. And now these subsets on the right uh, are going to in intersect. So that's how we're able to get that the composed function, when it's composed in this way, the number of variables actually shrinks. And we'll be able to do this in a way that shrinks the number of variables, but keeps the depth relation what it was before. Uh, so that, I think that's a very cool idea. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see if, if, a, if, if a lifting theorem for this set, I, I, we think we can prove lifting theorems for the setup and would they have other applications? Uh, and then, yeah, just to close, um, so there's lots of open questions, uh, you know, the ones that people tend to obsess about are these top few, lifting with constant size gadgets. I'm not even sure what the answer is, but it's, uh, I think it's a really, really interesting question. Um, for the DAG-like lifting case, um, we don't know how to kind of do this in the randomized case, just deterministic. And it's really quite brittle, this argument in some ways. So we're not even able to switch the gadget to any other gadget besides the besides the index gadget. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if we can also prove supercritical trade-offs from monotone circuits. So, you know, we have a way to go from um, <clears throat> the proof complexity or communication bounds to monotone circuit bounds. So can we uh, also show that there's monotone functions that have low depth monotone circuits, but if you restrict the size to be sub-exponential, then does the depth as the depth, you know, become really large. And I think there's really nothing known along these lines. Um, I already mentioned uh, it'd be great to get some new lower bounds for AC0, maybe using uh, something like robust sunflowers. Um, I'm particularly interested in proving lifting theorems for these other models, number on forehead communication, information complexity, and pseudo-deterministic communication complexity. Um, but I think I'll end here. Thank you.